I, I approached him once at a concert because I wanted to know if something new was coming up. Yeah, what's, what's the new record? <clears throat> and he said, well, these musicians are playing these new works of his very beautifully and no one seemed to be interested to record them. Although he, he didn't have a, a clear uh, input on how something should be recorded, uh, he knew exactly who the right performers were so it would be done correctly in the right spirit right type of interpretation. to accept that we human beings are self-opaque. 
And I want to push the idea that this is much harder and much less straightforward than is usually acknowledged. And I'm going to suggest that aesthetic experience can enable an especially vivid appreciation of the self opacity. But as my title suggests, uh, which is, I think, psychic patterns in horror films, I'm not just interested in any aesthetic experience, I'm interested in genre films, and in one genre in particular, namely the erotic thriller, the tawdry genre that peaked in the late 80s and through the 1990s. These films are typically panned as bad, as poorly acted, poorly written, over the top, and also as derivative as poor man's Hitchcock, as offering nothing new. So I think the best way to set up the connection that I want to draw between self-opacity and erotic thrillers is by recounting an experience that I had, one that was generated by Nastasia Kinski's face. So my preoccupation with these films began when I was trying to understand the disorienting, indeed opaque experience I had while studying Kinski in Paul Schrader's supernatural erotic thriller, Cat People. What I was struck by was her emphatically flat acting style and her blank stare, which seemed to communicate an eerie kind of deathlessness and an uncanny kind of automatism. It's like looking at a pure image rather than at a fully formed character. And many critics have complained virulently about the superficiality of acting in erotic thrillers or about the thinness of the characters. You might have remembered the uh, outcry in response to the 1999 film Eyes Wide Shut. So the critics seemed bothered, offended even, that these films are not interested in robust individuality and psychological depth. Rather, they're interested in the mechanisms and repetitions of genre. And so I began to think of these films as exploring the idea of human life as structured by patterns and repetitions as to some degree mechanical or unthinking. Erotic thrillers in particular also suggest that, suggest that human desire, fantasy, and satisfaction are to a large degree generic, both for the characters and for us viewers. After all, we go to erotic thrillers in order to experience a generic, conventional pattern of cinematic satisfaction. So these films offer an alternative to the picture of human beings as autonomous and unique individuals who are in charge of their own lives, suggesting instead that we are in fact driven by mechanism, that we are caught up in patterns that operate all behind our backs. So what I'm going to say here tonight is my first attempt to connect these two themes, self-opacity on the one hand and genre on the other, in the hopes that you might come to get a sense of why I think the latter has a lot to tell us about the former. So let me set the stage by asking, what's involved, again, in really knowing or sincerely accepting that we human beings are self-opaque? What would be involved in taking these psychological and philosophical things to heart? What kind of fact is this? And what kind of knowing is this? So we're told that human beings are self-opaque by contemporary psychologists working on bias and mental heuristics, or by figures like Freud and Nietzsche working on dreams and drives, or by Marx and contemporary political philosophers working on ideology. What they tell us is that the human mind is far less autonomous and less self-consciously self-directed than we imagine, but is rather deeply automatic, deeply patterned, and that such unconscious processing is what makes possible our everyday experience of self, world, and others. So while from my own first-person perspective, it seems like I make judgments about what to do and what to believe and what I want based on what I take to be my reasons and my preferences, all of this, we are told, is shaped and facilitated by so much activity that is not up to me and of which I am wholly unaware. Now in learning this uh, learning about this mental patterning and automaticity, it could like, seem like we're learning just more facts about the human species that we otherwise wouldn't know. And we learn a lot of facts these ways. So for instance, scientists tell me that human beings have a heart that pumps blood. This is a fact that's true of all humans, and since I know I'm a human, I know it's true of me. And so you might think, isn't self-opacity just like that? Can't we learn that most of mental life takes place behind consciousness, or that our beliefs and actions are explained by reasons we don't realize, 
Can't we all know all of this in exactly the same way that we come to know anything that science has to tell us about human beings that we otherwise wouldn't know? The problem, as I see it, is that learning that we are self-opaque is actually not at all like learning that the heart pumps blood. When I learn something new about the heart and how it functions, I come to know some facts about human physiology, and I know these facts as in the mode of a kind of empirical observer. But when it comes to the mind, this is not something I know as an observer. Rather, it seems intuitively that I know my own mind in a special or an immediate way. So if I told you that I was nervous about giving this talk, it would be strange to ask how I knew that or whether I was sure. It seems like I don't need to defer to experts' knowledge here, and I don't need to find some empirical evidence for these claims. That is, it seems like I know my mind in this special, immediate way because I am directly self-conscious of it, or even better, because I am that very mind. But when we learn that the human mind is opaque, what we're learning is that the very perspective we inhabit when we, when we attempt to understand this very proposal, the very perspective from which we ordinarily move through the world and make sense of ourselves, what we're being told is that this very perspective is opaque, that we don't really understand why we do what we do, or believe what we do, or feel as we do. And so while we may nod along and listen to psychologists or read Marx, Nietzsche, or Freud, the question again is, to what extent can I accept this? It is kind of unacceptable. Self-opacity, the idea that much of our own mental life is unavailable and unknowable, seems to be something that by definition cannot be straightforwardly known or accepted by that very self. And so it is very strange to be such a creature, to have a mind that is shaped as much by what it is aware of as what it is not, to be a creature that can be self-conscious of its own self-opacity. Taking these scientific and philosophical findings to heart is not at all straightforward. What would it mean for us to do so? But if it isn't straightforward to take this to heart, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It might just mean that in order to more intimately realize that we are self-opaque, we're going to need recourse to alternative kinds of knowledge or to certain kinds of experience. So are there ways in which self-opacity is not just conceded as an empirical fact about the human species, but is somehow intimately not acknowledged as true of me? So my suggestion is that this more intimate acknowledgement is facilitated when our ordinary first-person experience is somehow disrupted. So one way this happens, again, is when other people challenge our self-understanding. So if I think my academic aspirations are just an expression of my interest and ambition, but you can see that they're fueled by a more clandestine need for approval, then if we have this kind of friendship, I can learn of this unexpected motivation from you. Through this, I also come into a disorienting kind of contact with my own self-opacity. I'm brought to see the limits of my self-understanding and made to acknowledge that much of who I am is beyond what I can see. And notice that to the extent that I cannot tolerate the idea of my own opacity or cannot acknowledge it, I will thereby be that much more defensive against your interpretation, less willing to be corrected, less able to countenance the possibility that you might understand my mind better than I do. Another way we're brought to acknowledge our own self-opacity is through the kind of disruptive phenomena that Freud was interested in. Slips of the tongue, dreams, bodily and psychological symptoms, as well as fantasies, patterns and repetitions, and the unexpected dimensions and intensities of our own desires. These are phenomena within experience. They are there for everyone to see. He's not accessing the unconscious directly. Rather, these phenomena constitute disturbances right at the level of consciousness, disruptions on the surface of the mind, and strains on the coherence of experience. And these disruptions can take many forms, strange thoughts, disturbing feelings, unexpected associations, uncontrolled vocal inflections, sudden shifts in topics, repetitions, outbursts, silences. <laughs> With these inexplicable eruptions, 
The mind seems to interrupt and undermine its own ordinary functioning. So let's call these disruptions of consciousness disturbances in form. They are disruptions of mental coherence, or disruptions relative to otherwise coherent psychic life. So here the mind or the body erupts in some kind of activity that cannot be comprehended in terms of our ordinary ways of making sense of people. And so, although it can seem like Freud was interested in a specific illicit content, sex, say, in fact, the content is significant only insofar as it constitutes a disruption of ordinary mental functioning, and so just insofar as it resists straightforward integration within everyday human life. Okay, so I mentioned interpersonal disruptions and also the way that the mind can disrupt itself. I now finally want to turn to the question of aesthetic experience, as I think it too can occasion a kind of encounter with our own self-opacity. So notice that in aesthetic experience, one has the experience of being drawn to or riveted by an object without being able to make ordinary sense of why. Consider that if you could somehow render your experience transparent or straightforwardly comprehensible, the specific and powerful aesthetic dimension of the experience would thereby be lost. So the very inability to make ordinary sense, this fundamental opacity that characterizes aesthetic experience, seems to be essential to being riveted in the first place. And so it's essential to aesthetic experience as such. And so now we can ask, are there any aesthetic forms that seem especially well suited for exploring self-opacity? So it might at first seem that the most apt approach would be something totally anti-narrative, perhaps surrealism, or maybe avant-garde or experimental theater or filmmaking, where these work to deconstruct narrative cohesion and perhaps depict something like dream content or the logic of the unconscious. The problem, I think, is that in a way these efforts try to achieve the impossible, to step outside of the coherence of consciousness and represent the unconscious directly. But whatever it means to aesthetically render or provide an occasion to encounter our self-opacity, it cannot involve attempting to disclose that which is opaque, since that is by definition what's out of view. Rather, just as Freud showed that we only know the unconscious through disruptions of consciousness, so too I think the most effective aesthetic renderings of self-opacity must not wholly abandon narrative coherence, but must maintain it while generating uncanny disruptions of form something happening right on the aesthetic surface. So why I think that genre films, and erotic thrillers in particular, are relevant here? <coughs> like the reaction. Um, okay, so in a particularly straightforward sense, erotic thrillers are concerned with human fantasy particularly fantasies about the overwhelming power of desire and its perverse intertwinement with violence. In these films, the protagonist is typically an utterly unexceptional, utterly conventional white male. He's actually typically Michael Douglas. <laughs> and he gets caught up in some kind of entanglement with an attractive, dangerous, desirous woman and his life is temporarily derailed before returning to balance and normalcy, often with a suburban wife. <laughs> so on the level of content, these films engage with a fantasy, a dream or a nightmare, that desire might be so powerful as to destroy a person's life, that there are forces within us that we cannot understand and cannot control. And I should just mention that insofar as these films explore the idea that female sexuality is unfathomably destructive, the most intelligent erotic thrillers function to ironically engage and critically interrogate this conventional ideological fantasy, whereas the genuinely bad ones are simply reaffirming the cliché. So I think Eyes Wide Shut and Body Double are in the former category, and Fatal Attraction and countless others are in the latter. But what I think is even more interesting, even more uncanny, than this fantasy about the force of desire is thinking about the structures and patterns that constitute a genre, and about what the very idea of genre suggests about human life. So in order to appreciate any individual erotic thriller, we have to see that film not as an isolated or radically unique work of art, but rather as the exemplification of a genre, as one instance of a type, or as one iteration of a pattern. <coughs> 
Characters in genre films are thus not meant to be highly idiosyncratic individuals with deep psychologies and complex personalities. Rather, they function as types or as moments within a larger complex structure. This means in turn that these films explore human desire and fantasy precisely as generic, as patterned and rep repetitive. Uh, repetitive. Uh, hence the thinness of character, hence the acting style that is in turn flat and hyperbolic. Hence the feeling that these movies are corny or derivative or cliché. So I think it's wrong to hold them to the standards of psychological depth or authenticity. Rather, these films push back against those ideals, offering an alternative way of thinking about human beings, not as unique individual agents, but rather as caught up in patterns, mechanisms, and conventions that they themselves do not understand. So genre films offer an alternative vision of human being, a contestation of the autonomy model. Finally, what distinguishes the most interesting, artful, even philosophical instances of this genre, and here I include Body Double, Basic Instinct, Cat People, Eyes Wide Shut, Mulholland Drive, and there are others. What distinguishes these cases are the way they momentarily depart from straightforward narrative through stylistic or aesthetic interventions that function as what I above called disruptions of form. So less accomplished narrative films will use aesthetic and stylistic techniques in such a way as to obfuscate themselves in order to better serve the plot. In these cases, style is subservient to plot. But the genuinely interesting, genuinely inventive genre films use such cinematic techniques precisely in order to generate disturbances, disruptions on the surface of the film, strains on the coherence of narrative. So such techniques include, for example, the unnerving acting style that I've spoken about, strange doublings, jarring editing, incongruent auditory elements, over-the-top color palettes, strange interiors and locations, exaggerated camera angles and dizzying zooms, and dream or fantasy sequences. Rather than serve the narrative, these interventions constitute aesthetic eruptions that cannot be comprehended in terms of our ordinary ways of making sense of plot or character psychology. They are eruptions of pure style, and Susan Sontag defines style as exactly what is excessive to any purpose. So these stylistic interventions also call our attention to the film status as an image or product that is, as the result of a vast network of formative activities and processes of production that take place essentially out of view, behind the scenes. So while all these films are narratively coherent, heavily plotted, the most interesting instances of the genre use cinematic techniques that disrupt that coherence with eruptions of sheer stylization. And the philosophical upshot of this combination is the implication that everything that is seen or available to consciousness depends upon a vast network of mechanisms, patterns, and conventions that operate off-screen. So I've said too little to make my case for the important connections between the idea that we are self-opaque and subject to formative forces and the unique aesthetic object known as the erotic thriller. But I hope maybe you're beginning to see first how difficult and strange it is to honestly acknowledge that we are self-opaque. And second, that genre films offer a fascinating and unsettling alternative to the conception of human beings as autonomous and self-conscious, self-directing agents. So against such a confident, optimistic picture, erotic thrillers suggest instead that we human beings are riveted by thoroughly generic fantasies, and that our lives are themselves organized by mechanisms that remain essentially out of view, but for the occasional disorienting disruption. Thank you.
que lo que yo te ofrezco es algo incondicional. Vagabundas que se 
voices have not been heard. So, if you if you've heard about the history of philosophy, you've heard a story about sort of great white men followed by great white men. And if you you sort of told, heard the Sanders story, you might think, well, gee, it's really too bad that all the, there, were, there were no women in history and philosophy. There were no women who wrote before 20, um, the 20th century because you know, it was really sad that women weren't educated. They weren't allowed to be trained in philosophy. So if you've heard something like that, you've probably heard something along this version of philosophy's past. So I'll just read this to you kind of quickly because so we'll, we don't have a huge amount of time. It's, it's a parody, by the way. Um, it came to pass that the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the earth. And the Creator saw that the darkness was evil, and He spoke out in the darkness, saying, Let there be light. And there was light, and He called the light Renaissance. And thus it was that the continental rationalists came to be. Descartes begat Spinoza, and Spinoza begat Leibniz. And thus it was that the British empiricists came to be. So that Hobbes begat Locke, and Locke begat Barclay, and Barclay begat Hume. And then it was that there arose the great sage of Königsberg, the great Immanuel, Immanuel Kant, who though neither empiricist nor rationalist was likened to both. He it was who combined the eye of the scientist and the mind of the mathematician. And this too the creator saw, and he saw that it was good, and he sent goodly men and scholars true to tell the story and so on. Now this would just be merely funny, except it remains relatively true. I mean, most a lot of people, geez, okay, a lot of people actually teach the history, continue to teach the history of philosophy in this way. In fact, notice that um, these are the kind of great introductions to philosophy. The, the book on the left, the Norton Introduction to Philosophy, was supposed to be the great new uh, history of philosophy, introduction to philosophy. And it's a, fa it ha it's a, it's a thousand, one hundred and something, something words. It's divided up into problems in the history of philosophy. And there's not a single woman, Muslim thinker, Islamic thinker, or Jewish thinker, discussed, um, bef who wrote before the mid-20th century. So you might, again, you might think from the, on the basis of this that there weren't any women in the history of philosophy. And this I also thought for a long time. I also bought the myth. And then it turned out there was a lot of really interesting feminist scholars in the 70s and 80s who began looking at and discovering women in early modern philosophy. And Conway, Margaret Cavendish, people many of you may have heard about. And this sort of got me interested. In fact, one of my friends encouraged me to be thinking about this. This got me interested, and then I started working on a woman called Anne Conway. I did Leibniz for years, so I did my, my great man. But one of the things about Conway I realized is that she thought, get this, 17th century thinker who thought that all human beings are equal, that all human beings, regardless of what their religion, religion is, regardless of whether they've ever heard of Jesus Christ or whatever, they have the right to dignity and are equal. So this then kind of blew my mind and got me interested in sort of looking back at what other women had said about suffering and about love and about the way in which God might have created um, a, a world full of people who are supposed to be equal. And this led me to a new project of mine, which is about late medieval women and the way in which they actually proposed radical views about the nature of the world, but they were embedded in a, what, what was what's called, or I call, the meditative genre. So it was a meditation reflection on God, but also a reflection on the soul. So embedded in this relatively conservative, if you want to put it that way, kind of Catholic view of the world, they make really radical claims. I think that's the angels um, speaking. All right, so let me tell you how this story got going very, very quickly. What's fascinating is the narrative about great men followed by great men didn't exist until the 19th century. It was begun by Hegel, actually it doesn't exist in Kant. Schopenhauer did it too, and then other Germans I don't have time to talk about kind of sealed the deal. Now notice this is actually really incredible. Hegel says in 1820 that Germanic, i.e. modern philosophy begins with Descartes. Now he of course thinks sees Descartes as leading up to him. So does Schopenhauer.
Again, I wish I could tell you more about what these people say about the history of philosophy, but they're the ones that created, or began to create, this story about Descartes being the father of modern philosophy. I, I've written a paper showing that Descartes got many of his most, what are supposed to be his most radical ideas, from Teresa of Avila, a Spanish nun. So you can look at that. I think that's, that's, that was published a few years ago in Phil's studies. But now I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about how amazing it is that women wrote at all in medieval Europe. Now I probably don't need to quote these bits of the, of the Bible to you, but you may know them. But it's striking, Paul writes, women would remain, should remain silent in churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. And you probably can't read the bottom here, so I'll read it. A woman must quietly receive instruction and entire submissiveness. I do, sorry, what? Somebody yelling, okay. Um, <laughs> is this upsetting to people? Okay, <laughs> you get the point, right? In the Gospels, or, or at least in Paul, the idea is that women are not supposed to speak. Now, interesting, they didn't first centuries. And so you can tell that they began to speak. You know that something bad is happening when powerful men start complaining. And so here's the Chancellor of the University of Paris writing in the 14th century, the female sex is forbidden to teach in public. So women must have been teaching, right? All women's teaching, particularly formal teaching by word and by writing, is to be held suspect unless it has been diligently examined and much more fully than men. The reason is clear. Following Eve, Eve's legacy, what's Eve's legacy? The fact that she sinned first and brought about the fall. All right, so because of that, women are easily seduced and determined seducers and because it is not proved that they are witnesses to divine grace. So no wonder women weren't allowed to go to the university. They were seducers in any way they couldn't actually reason and develop anything like a proper philosophy. So one of the really dramatic things I learned that historians of philosophy have not looked at at all, though historians of theology and religion and um, history and art history have, is around 1300, I wish I had more time to tell you about this, but around 1300, this radical thing happened. Before that time, Jesus as the, as the, was considered the king of heaven, the judger. But suddenly, around 1300, people became interested in the affect of, of Christ, his suffering, his passions, and the fact that he died and suffered for the sake of humanity. Now again, for those of us who are not sympathetic to, to, to Christianity, this maybe seems a little kind of creepy, but the underlying political punch of this is profound. Here's a person who was willing to sacrifice himself so that other people could find the way to truth, and in fact, for him, and he taught others something like the way to, the, the way to truth was, was through suffering. So what women began to do was talk about their suffering. They couldn't, they weren't allowed to do philosophy, but they wrote meditations, and the meditation was on, the meditations were on the suffering of Christ, and how, so, so this is like a really interesting example of how women had to struggle to find epistemic authority. They looked at Christ, they contemplated Christ, and then they created a metaphysics based on their views. Again, I don't have a whole lot of time, I'll just point out, that a lot of scholars have noted that there's this effective revolution where people are supposed to develop sympathy for all humanity by focusing on how Christ suffered. It's really wonderful. The women didn't write at first. They had books written about them and for them. Now this is a, a Meditazione Christi, a meditation on Christ that the, the, a bunch of uh, women had written, and notice who's, who's preaching here. This is Mary. Mary is going out and preaching to the world. Joseph is over there kind of taking care of the kid. Right? So there's a kind of radical aspect to what was going on. And then revolution really did happen. Then women started writing meditations and offering what I would say a metaphysics. Now the problem with kind of understanding the metaphysics is that it's embedded in this very strange genre of meditating on the passions of Christ. 
but, they, but from that, people talk about their bodies as a source, interesting, as a source of understanding. Philosophically very strange. So, again, this is like you can't read this, but this is Hildegard von Bingham, who's writing in the 12th century, and I'll just tell you, she says that the soul is a breath of living spirit, and that with excellent sensitivity permeates the entire body. And she goes on to say, the earth is mother. So what Hildegard is one of the first people to develop, and people all over Europe, often they didn't know about one another because they couldn't communicate with one another. Women weren't allowed to write and share books. But what's fascinating, it wasn't just women. Some men did it too. But many of these nuns started thinking about God as mother, God as genderless, who has created the whole everything in the world and made everything in it good and capable of love. And if you understand how to love in the right way, you understand that all human beings are equal and need to be treated accordingly. Here is one of my favorite people, Julian of Norwich. She's an anchoress. Who here knows what the heck an anchoress is? It's a really weird thing. It's women who would lock themselves in a tiny room in connection with the church, so they didn't have to marry, they didn't have to like mess with the people on the outside. They often had a window, this is hilarious, they often had a window onto the outside world and they were basically like the therapist in a lot of towns. People would come and talk to them and get advice from them. But as an anchoress, i.e. they were anchored to a church, they could do whatever the hell they wanted because they were considered really holy. And one of the things that Julian does is write about the metaphysics of love, again, and the, and the, and the underlying idea there is that all people are equal. 